Hello everyone, welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. My name is Seth Mayo, I'm the curator of astronomy for the Loman Planetarium. And in this week's episode, we are covering the dates of February 15th through February 21st. And what we're gonna cover is the moon and where it will be in the sky. We'll be passing by some nice objects. And then we're gonna spend some time talking again about Mars. There is a new rover that I've mentioned in the past that will be landing on Mars on Thursday, February 18th in the afternoon. And we are very excited to talk about that and a couple other missions that have entered orbit around Mars as well. So this is definitely a Mars episode. So let's get to it. For this week, the moon will be in some of my favorite phases and positions in the sky. So right after sunset, if you're looking out towards the west, starting out on Monday the 15th, the moon will be a really nice crescent shape. You may even see some earth shine, that reflected light from the earth shining back on the night side of the moon. It is a lovely sight to see and it probably something that most of you have seen before in the past. So starting that night, actually the moon is sitting in a rather dim and not as well-known constellation. And this constellation is called Cetus, the sea monster. So the stars of Cetus aren't very bright, but it's a big constellation and it represents a very, very large creature in the sky from Greek mythology, Cetus, or also known as the whale, was this giant creature that came out of the sea and in one story fought Perseus, the mighty warrior who saved Andromeda, Princess Andromeda, from being eaten by the sea monster. So he's well known in Greek mythology, but is a constellation you can find in the fall and even part of the winter time. So the moon is sitting inside of that. And as we continue to move through the week here as we get to Tuesday, then the moon will briefly move through the constellation called Pisces, the fish. Many of you know that from one of the signs of the zodiac. So you can see just kind of the base of Pisces. The moon will be moving through, still a crescent shape by then. And we'll continue on this path as the moon makes its way into Wednesday, moving past the head of Cetus and then to Thursday when it starts entering the stars of Taurus the Bull, one of those winter constellations that we spent time on recently. And by that night on the 18th, which is Thursday, you'll find that the moon will be almost half full, but also very close to that reddish looking object right there. That is the planet Mars. And we're gonna talk about that in a moment. So that's a really nice pairing and it's a very convenient date for the moon to get close to Mars as seen from Earth. And so that's kind of at the bottom of Taurus the bull that we see there. And if we continue on through the rest of the week as we get to Friday, the moon will move even further into Taurus. And then by Saturday into the horns of the bull. And then by Sunday, a little bit out of the horns and starting to enter the constellation of Gemini, another great winter constellation that you see there. So the moon will be moving through a nice little area, going through some nice phases as we move through crescent in the first quarter and then into a waxing gibbous phase that you see by the end of the week. Now I mentioned how the moon was very conveniently next to Mars on the 18th and the reason why is because on that date NASA's Perseverance rover will be landing hopefully on Mars at 3.55 p.m. Eastern Time. It's the approximate landing time. And if all goes well, there'll be a new rover driving on the surface. So it's so nice that the moon will be next to Mars that evening, kind of helping us to celebrate this important achievement in planetary exploration. And not only is Perseverance landing on Mars or arriving there, just recently, last week, two more missions to Mars successfully entered orbit around the planet, which is so great to see other organizations, other nations being able to explore the planet as well. So on February 9th, the United Arab Emirates Hope spacecraft successfully completed what's called 
orbital insertion. That is basically the spacecraft entering orbit around Mars as the Martian gravitational field sort of pulled in the spacecraft successfully. And so this new probe will be looking at the atmosphere of Mars from the top down. It will be looking at many layers of, of the high levels of the atmosphere down to the lower levels, looking at the weather patterns, the climate change that's been going on Mars for the last millions and billions of years. And some are saying this is kind of the first true weather satellite for Mars. And so that's provided by the United Arab Emirates. They're only the second nation to ever successfully get something in orbit around Mars on their first try. China did that before, and now the United Arab Emirates. And this was a joint sort of mission with the United States as well. The University of Colorado Boulder helped to build the spacecraft that that nation used to explore Mars. So that's pretty exciting. And then a day later, on February 10th, China's Tianwen-1 orbiter, lander, and rover, this one spacecraft, all together successfully completed orbital insertion. And it's a three-tier mission there. So it has an orbiter that will fly around Mars studying the atmosphere, the high levels of the atmosphere called the ionosphere, and even look at the water ice distribution on the surface of Mars. And then the China National Space Administration will eventually choose a landing site and try to bring its lander down, so detach from the orbiter in May of this year, and bring it down to some location they choose on Mars, and then hopefully successfully land, and then release a rover that will drive around on the surface looking at Martian soil and rocks, and maybe even looking for past signs of life or the environment of life that could support it at least, and maybe even cache some rocks, so basically hold on to some rocks for a later sample return. And so that's a pretty cool mission as well. And Tian Wen means heavenly questions or a quest for heavenly truth. It's named after an ancient Chinese poem. Very fitting as they try to answer questions that have come up on this red planet. So it's kind of neat that these other nations are getting to Mars as Perseverance is as well. They all launched at roughly the same time in July of last year, and they all took about a six to seventh month journey to the planet. They had to launch around that time because last October, Mars was at a very close approach to us. If you remember from my past episode, I talk about its closest approach to Earth in many years and how it was so, so bright. Well, you wanna time the launches just before that so that you have a smaller distance between Earth and Mars, you don't need as much fuel and you can bring a bigger payload to the planet. And here is the launch that I filmed last July of the Perseverance rover from Cape Canaveral. This is in slow motion. I've shown it before. It's always fun to watch it again as that Perseverance rover sitting on top of this Atlas V rocket launched for its closest seventh month's journey. And we're finally at the end of that journey. So let's actually fly to Mars in our software called Open Space and just take a look at the planet and what Perseverance will do soon. Hey, we made it to Mars and we're using the free and powerful software Open Space, which is really fun to use to fly through the universe and look at all these three dimensional environments of our solar system and beyond. It's a lot of fun and I use it from time to time in my programs. So hopefully, on Thursday, February 18th, approximately 3.55 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, NASA's Perseverance rover will touch down safely and securely on the Martian surface. And that's traveling almost seven months and hundreds of millions of miles through space and some orbital trajectory maneuvers and the harsh environment of space, going through all of that to make its way down to the surface and to drive around and search for past signs of life. Now, the landing is quite a harrowing experience. NASA already had a similar type of landing with a very similar rover called Curiosity that landed on a different part of Mars, not too, too far away, but on a different side of the planet in 2012. And there is a part of the mission called Entry, Descent, and Landing. They just shortened it, or NASA shortened it, to EDL, since they love their acronyms. They also call this the seven minutes of terror because from the top of the atmosphere down to the surface takes about seven very scary and terrifying minutes for engineers. 
but they've already done this before successfully. So once Perseverance arrives at Mars in its spacecraft, it will eventually eject its cruise stage and enter the Martian atmosphere at 12,000 miles per hour. As it plows through that air, it heats up and the heat shield at the bottom protects it from temperatures up to 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. And as it's moving very fast through the atmosphere, it's going to have thrusters on the back shell, the top part of the spacecraft, that can maneuver and guide the entire vehicle on the right trajectory to land in the correct place on the planet. As it comes down, that heat shield actually slow it down to just under a thousand miles per hour. And then soon after, the high speed parachutes will deploy, slowing it down even further. And then the heat shield will actually eject, uncovering some of the cameras at the bottom of the rover. And those cameras will help to guide the vehicle down to the correct location to avoid any hazards. As it comes down and as it slows down even more, those parachutes will slow it down to about 200 miles per hour. And after that point, and at about 7,000 feet above the Martian surface, the descent stage, which is attached to the rover, much like a jetpack, is ejected from the back shell, and then soon after, lights its retro rockets, these eight rockets that slow down even more, and it continues its descent downwards, and eventually it slows it down to about 1.7 miles per hour to about 66 feet above the surface. And then that descent stage, that jetpack, will lower the rover down with cables in what's called the sky crane maneuver. It will lower down very slowly. Once those wheels feel the ground and the weight of the rover, the cables are cut and the descent stage is ejected or launches away to another location to land safely away from Perseverance. So that's what the seven minutes of terror look like in a condensed version. All of those steps have to be executed precisely and at the right times to get this rover safely on the ground. And just keep in mind, this can't be done live. Due to the distance between Mars and Earth, there is a time delay. So we can't actively control the sequence. We have to rely on Perseverance's computers to autonomously guide this whole process and to run through it itself. So that's what makes it even more amazing. And that's why this is such a harrowing experience for the rover and for engineers and scientists on Earth. And hopefully this will all occur successfully on the 18th and eventually Perseverance can start exploring the surface of Jezero Crater. So let's take a quick look at that location and what this rover will be looking for. As we make our way down to the Martian surface where Perseverance will hopefully land soon, we can look at the areas around the planet. Kind of to the bottom right, there is a large impact basin called Isidus Basin, a huge impact that occurred there long ago. Kind of at the top now are these ridges called Neely Fosse, these very large ridge lines. And then now kind of near the bottom left of the screen is a volcanic area called Sirtis Major. And embedded in all of that is a small crater about 30 miles wide known as Jezero Crater. And that was picked out of many sites on Mars over some years. I was finally picked about a couple years ago by a team of scientists. And this crater is really interesting because we believe that billions of years ago it was filled with water. And we can see evidence of that in this satellite imagery. And we're seeing a lot of imagery from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that orbits around Mars and takes high resolution images of the surface, giving us amazing detail of the planet. And we can see an inflow channel here where water came in to the crater, at least evidence of that, and an outflow channel there, so the water left. So the water pooled in this area. What's fascinating is as the water came in, it left behind a river delta that we see here. So the water had soot and soil and material inside of it, and that kind of fell to the bottom and created layers of a lot of clay-like materials that can preserve really interesting things like organics and maybe the ingredients for life and maybe life itself. And so scientists thought this would be a great place to send a rover to. And as we come down even further, we can see even higher resolution imagery of the exact landing location that we hope Perseverance will make it to. And so as we continue down here, we can see how high resolution these images are as we kind of see a little closer here. And the precise location that the rover we hope will land in is about right here, so right in the thick of this river delta. And once it hopefully lands here, the rover will start driving around in its primary mission, 
looking at the Martian soil, studying the geology, looking at the atmosphere and the weather on the planet. And as it does so, it will collect samples for later sample return missions. It's gonna make its own oxygen, which serves as a technology demonstrator for human missions in the future when oxygen needs to be made on the surface. It has a drone helicopter that it's going to deploy and allow it to fly around and be the first powered flight on another planet, which is pretty exciting. And the main objective is to look for past signs of life, which is very, very exciting. It's one of the first missions to do this with the right technology, looking for not large forms of life, but microscopic, really bacteria that lived on Mars possibly billions of years ago. Something we call cyanobacteria on Earth. We might find that here in layers of what are called stromatolites. And we found that on Earth, and some of the oldest type of life on Earth looks like that. So we think if there ever was life that arose on Mars, and the early forms of it may have looked similar in an area like this that was wet and had organics and material that could maybe feed and support life. And that's what this rover will hopefully find. And maybe with those sample returns, bring the material back then we find it at that point. But that's really, really a big deal for this mission and for any mission we've ever sent to any world. And it's exciting what Perseverance may do in the future. So stay tuned. There's a lot of things in store. But hopefully that landing goes well on the 18th and we see a new rover successfully on the surface, the fifth for NASA and a rover that the whole world can celebrate. And on the evening of the 18th, if you're outside and you have a clear sky, maybe you'll see Mars next to the moon, which is quite nice. And you can think about this new rover that made it all the way from Earth to the planet that will be looking for past signs of life. And it's amazing to know how we're reaching out in our solar system and beyond. Hey, that's it for another edition of our Sky Tonight. Thank you very much for tuning in. And if you're ever in the area in Daytona Beach, please stop on by the Loman Planetarium. We're doing shows every day and of course, safely so check out our website for more information we hope to see you back here again next week and I'd like to say go perseverance and happy stargazing take care